Well, thank you for the opportunity to make a few uh, remarks at the near the beginning of the of your uh, identity conference. I don't think I don't think anyone needs to be told why uh, this issue matters and why we're spending so much of your and our uh, and now I refer to the politicians' effort on working with the challenges of. Uh, managing identity in a digital world. Uh, someone mentioned to me the other day that in a sense it doesn't matter because uh, there's sufficient predictive analytic capacity around to know who you are without you telling us. Uh, by the time we, we or they uh, who accumulate digital information look through the actions you take, they can pretty much sort out uh, who you are from what you do. Uh, now that's not really a feasible position for government to take, that it doesn't matter. But certainly uh, government has the opportunity to, while it has the opportunity to use those tools, it needs to think pretty carefully about how they use it. Just another example of the assumptions we make around these issues. Uh, yesterday the government announced a policy where people who buy and sell property uh, will now be required to supply their IRD number. The very first question I got from someone who uh, heard the announcement was, don't they have it already? Uh, which I have to say was my first question when it was first suggested a few months ago uh, that this might be a way of um, enabling policy, enabling it to en enabling the enforcement of our tax policy with respect to property. I just thought if I didn't supply the IRD number, uh, then LINS or IRD could quite easily go and get it. But apparently that's not the case. So those are just a couple of examples in, um, of how this world is evolving, both uh, with new tools for establishing identity, whether the customer likes it or not, uh, and that sits alongside the fact that we have all sorts of assumptions about who knows what about us. I just wanted to remind ourselves why um, the government is interested uh, in who you are. Uh, you'll all be familiar with, and there's two, two, really two different types of uh, policy where identity is going to matter a lot. Uh, the first is uh, around result 10. Uh, we need to keep pace with the rest of the community uh, and the experience that uh, voters, taxpayers, citizens have by enabling uh, easy digital connection with government. So the key element of result 10 is that all our interactions should be digital by default. Uh, and of course, there's many other aspects of that which you'll discuss uh, over the next day or two, over <coughs> which you'll discuss further if you haven't already. So with respect to result 10, uh, we can only provide an integrated service if people allow that to happen. And that is uh, if, if we want to have one way of um, relating to government or have a lifetime, life cycle version of interactions with government. Uh, the public need to feel comfortable with that, but almost certainly uh, you could characterise that as government knowing more about you than it used to know because it has the data or information or access to it more integrated. The other area where uh, identity is going to matter a lot is uh, with the social investment framework uh, and our push to take a customer view. Now that's not fundamentally driven by the fact that, d that uh, we've got better technology uh, for uh, knowing who people are, it's actually driven by a philosophical view that um, when we're dealing particularly with the most disadvantaged and most vulnerable of our citizens, we should treat them as citizens, uh, as people, as individuals, as families, as communities, 
and not as uh, classes of people who are subject to social policy. Uh, and also enable a much more individualised, tailored, personalised set of solutions uh, to the complex and sometimes chaotic lives uh, that they find themselves leading. In a, getting that customer view to occur and getting the types of individualised solutions uh, that we're interested in does require us to ask some pretty straightforward questions, which we now ask about all new policies, all new social policy initiatives. Uh, which people where? So if someone rolls up to um, the Minister of Finance office at least with a great idea about how to keep young people on the tr uh, headed in the right direction or doing something for vulnerable children, uh, the question, my question now is, well, which ones? and where. And the reason we ask that is because we have decades of policy which uh, consisted of throwing millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, thousands of uh, professional uh, hours at uh, groups of people who were never quite specified sufficiently to tell later whether the policy was effective or to hold anyone accountable for impact. So alongside the philosophical view that we should treat people as if they're real people with aspirations that can be realised, uh, we also want to know which people were so that we can tell whether we made any difference. Because the reason people hand over their PAYE at the end of the week or the fortnight, two or three, four hundred dollars that they could have used better, the reason they hand it over is because they think we are making a difference to someone else's life. Uh, too often we haven't. We've de delivered policy that made us feel good, that enabled the launch of a program, uh, that made it look like we cared, but we never went back to see whether it made any difference. And actually, we couldn't, because often we didn't know and still don't know who gets our service. We don't know whether the people who most need it get it. We don't know whether the service they get has any much impact. Uh, and we don't know whether we've effected the kind of significant changes in their lives that are sometimes needed. Uh, we do have something of a moral compulsion to do so, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. Uh, we now have a pretty good idea of the kind of circumstances that lead to uh, both expensive outcomes for government but also negative outcomes for a community. So if you take a child under five who is known to children, children young persons in their family service who are known to SIFs, where at least one parent uh, in the household is on a benefit and where either of the parents have had contact with corrections and a surprising number of young people in New Zealand have. Uh, in one of our provincial towns, one in ten children have a parent who have had contract, contact with the corrections department through community or custodial sentencing. So we can pretty much forecast now that that child under five, with those characteristics, contact with SIFs, parent on a benefit, uh, and parent who's had some kind of sentence, that by the age of 35 they're five times more likely to, a, to be a long-term beneficiary than the average, and seven times more likely to be in prison by age 21 than the average. So we know that. A lot of these kids are million dollar kids. So there is a trade-off here. Uh, if we know a bit more about them in a more integrated way, we may be able to change the course of that life. We may be able to. If we can't know that much about them, it's almost certain that we can't change the course of their life. Uh, the fact that there's 20,000 children in New Zealand with parents in prison tells you that we haven't been making much impact with what we know. Uh, another even more simple example, uh, we have 
you know, many of the people who, with whom, for whom we need to make the most impact, as I've indicated, spend their time uh, in our corrections system. Uh, of the 7,500 people, this is mainly males, who leave prison each year, within 12 months, 5,500 of them are on a sickness benefit. So after having them had, had them in, in prison where they're off drugs, uh, not committing offences, uh, increasingly now working and earning qualifications, within 12 months of leaving, uh, they're, on, they're on a sickness benefit. In fact, it's the single biggest flow onto sickness benefit. Uh, with a, it's got a different name now, SLP, Supported Living Payment, or Job Seeker HCID, uh, but we'll call it sickness benefit. Um, <laughs> we'll all get used to the new names because they're pretty, it's pretty important that we change our view of people's prospects. Uh, it's the main flow on to sickness benefit. Uh, now these are people about whom we know an awful lot. We've dug through their lives as they went through the court system. Uh, they've had pretty much increasingly individual rehabilitation type plans in prison. Uh, and then when they turn up on a sickness benefit, we treat them like a, like a complete stranger. In fact, of all the people who went on benefit last month, 70% of them had been on benefit before. When they turn up, we can treat them as if they as if we don't know them at all. Now that may be respecting their privacy. It may also be a disrespect uh, for people who need more support, uh, people who would actually benefit for, by being treated uh, as if they're capable uh, and able of realising their aspirations. So the whole issue of identity sits in the middle of a broader push that, require, that, in my view, compels us to be more effective in our interventions uh, in the lives of people who most need it, uh, and having a more uh, trusted relationship with them. However, there are some blockages in the way, and I just want to mention uh, one or two It seems to me that we may make more progress on this if we enable people to make more choices about how the government deals with their identity. At least conceptually, there's a couple of different paths here. One is for all of us uh, to collaborate across our government agencies uh, with our legal advice and try and evolve different structures of the current restrictions on privacy. That's a path which has got some promise and we're making a little making some progress. Another pathway though would be to uh, enable the people with whom we have uh, with whom we are transacting or with whom we have some kind of service relationship to actively supervise, the use of their identity and data. Now that's a much more open-ended and in, in a sense high risk way of approaching it. What if they choose uh, not to allow the government to know much about them? Well, I'm not quite sure what the answer is there. Uh, my guess is that most of them would choose more relaxed settings than we currently apply because they want the benefits of support of government, they want it to work for them, and they'd prefer to be treated as if they are known to government than treated as if they're not known by government. Uh, it seems to me a risk worth taking, because in the long run, the broader public will assert their view of identity anyway. One, if we get it wrong, well, then they will make their displeasure known. Uh, at the moment, there's something of a risk that we are bewildered by the complexity of public attitudes and it makes it hard for us to make progress. And by the complexity of public attitudes, I mean people who are willing to put all sorts of aspects of their lives on Facebook with apparently no sense of shame or embarrassment 
or privacy on one day and then the next day complain loudly and longly because a government department um, sent the wrong email to someone about some innocuous detail of their life and that's breaching their privacy and probably is breaching their privacy. And it puts public, the public service in a difficult position of trying to navigate these apparently contradictory uh, instincts in the public about privacy. So let, let's think about whether it's feasible to hand more of the responsibility uh, to them. I don't think that that's a, a, an answer to all our issues, but at the same time, as we realise the high transaction cost of the process we're in, of trying to devise uh, new kinds of agreements and collaborations within the privacy framework, uh, it may be worth uh, trying hand in control uh, to the citizen. A second area where I think we need more engagement is with the professional groups who deliver our services. Uh, <clears throat> my most recent advice is that we are making some progress on the identity and privacy issues around children's teams. Uh, now, children's teams are just one of a number of social innovations the government's putting in, uh, putting in place. Uh, we have a result, one of our 10 results is to reduce substantiated cases of abuse of children. Uh, we're not making much progress. To make more progress, we need to be more proactive with those children we can identify as vulnerable. Uh, the process of trying to take a child-centred view rather than a government department and provided centred view has turned out to be fairly demanding because it requires a range of professional and bureaucratic interests uh, to put aside at least some of those interests and work together in the interests of the child. Now that has run into, you know, for instance, by pooling information and designating someone as responsible for a child rather than no one responsible uh, for a child. Now that's run into some pretty uh, expensive uh, transactions, some pretty expensive discussions, and I know that because I'm just deal have just dealt with another round of budget bids where we're spending millions of dollars paying people to talk to each other who are already paid, actually, to talk to each other. That's what they do for showing up to work. However, uh, this is a stage we probably have to go through because it's run into the heavy weather of a, a, a pretty toxic mix of genuine ethical concerns, uh, genuine bureaucratic competition, that is, different organisations concerned that so if someone else is in charge, they won't be relevant, uh, and the old-fashioned well, not the old-fashioned, but the, I think the eternal problem of agencies, uh, that's government and non-government agencies, uh, for whom control of the information is what underpins their funding flow. That is concern that if they give away information, they will be less important professionally, but actually it might put their funding flow at risk because the person to whom they gave the information may be the one who's more able and effective in delivering uh, the service that's funded. I think we need to get the medical profession, the teaching profession, uh, police, the social work profession, uh, more openly and responsibly engaged in this discussion. Uh, because it's simply not good enough, in this case, to leave our most, ch most vulnerable children vulnerable to the lifetime damage of violence, the risk of death, uh, which you know always causes a sensation when it occurs, uh, simply because it's a bit difficult to grapple with these so-called professional issues. We need an open and responsible discussion that sorts out what really is ethical, of ethical concern, so that we can clearly balance up those concerns with the impact of sitting around talking and doing nothing while kids get beaten up. Because that's the trade-off. Uh, as it is with 
all sorts of other services we deliver. Um, it's one that's been you know, highlighted over many years in the mental health area. Uh, the trade-off between the privacy of the person uh, with a mental illness and the risk to life. And I know a bit about that, having been involved as a minister with some pretty tragic mistakes made in that trade-off, where people who didn't tell other people things um, may have been a bit surprised to find, up, find out that ended up with uh, people getting killed. So, <clears throat> and those are the things for which politicians are ultimately held accountable. Uh, when things go badly wrong, um, it's a bit of a story, it's often a review, it's a crisis, uh, it's a breakdown of the system, there's real public concern. So we need, we need to engage not just with ourselves in the public sector or those who deliver our services, but challenge some of the complacency and some of the territorial aspects of the uh, professional groups. Uh, often the frontline professionals that we are working with who do a fantastic job, often under very difficult circumstances, need permission from their group uh, to be able to participate more openly, uh, more fully and more responsibly in this discussion. Uh, so I would, um, I would certainly encourage uh, us heading in that direction. It's simply not good enough anymore uh, to say it's nothing to do with us if something goes wrong for that abused child. Our job is to guard our ethical concerns uh, our funding flows and our control. Um, the trade-offs need to be quite transparent. So all of this, I think, leads, to, leads me to um, a pretty simple conclusion, really, and that is that we, the, the tools for technical innovation in the digital world are, all, are, are here and they're going to develop fast, uh, but in a way, the technical innovation is the easy bit. The hard bit uh, is illustrated by the discussion of the, the, the issues I've just raised, and that is sorting out the implications of applying those technical solutions for how we organise ourselves. Because it's turning out that we can uh, much more easily and quickly come up with a new identity system or a new big data tool than we can come up with changing our institutions and being a bit more transparent about our ethical and professional concerns. Those cultural issues are more challenging because culture is by definition inertia. And the tools of identity and data are about it these days are about as much of an anti-inertial um, phenomenon as you could imagine. Uh, and <clears throat> we have the challenge and the opportunity to try and get these two quite different forms of uh, organisation to fit together. That is a very fast-moving digital environment and a very slow-moving culture of professionalism and, and institutional arrangement. Uh, and I don't say that in a way of saying it's just a task for other people because the most uh, institutionalised uh, um, arrangements we have are the constitutional ones uh, over which the politicians have control. So it's a bigger, almost a bigger challenge for us than anyone else. So I hope that your uh, deliberations over the next week while uh, with some very interesting speakers I see on your list are going to help us get some more answers to these questions. Thank you. <clears throat>